Human Rights Watch is one of the world's leading human rights organizations. And we specialize in documenting human rights abuses and we strive to, ch to change the world, just to make it a little bit better if we can. Our focus is on research, exposure and high level advocacy. And we publish many reports about Iran and that way try to give a voice to the victims of the many human rights abuses in Iran. But we also realize that we publish two reports a week, so you're not going to read them all, but you care about human rights. So we have an international film festival, the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. And currently we run annual festivals in cities like London and New York, Nairobi and Beirut. And in the Netherlands, here we started our office only two years ago, so we have one movie night together with uh, the Bali. And last year we showed a movie called Restrepo, which turned out not to be an easy movie about an American platoon in Afghanistan. <coughs> and it was a group of men that you really wanted to hate, but the film made that you liked them, which made it very uncomfortable. And some of the people who were there last night, uh, last year, said, why did you choose that movie? You can show only one movie a year, and then you choose this topic and this movie, so, and then I was preparing for tonight and I realized you can ask us the same thing about the movie of tonight. Because why did we choose a film about demonstrations in Iran three years ago? And so I'll tell you a little bit why we did. And the WE is a selection panel and it's made up by members of the so-called Netherlands Committee. Hollis Kerman, Glenda Nuhn, Gerda Kleikamp and Naima Tahir. And we watched many movies. And why did we come up with this one? And looking back, I came up with three important reasons. First of all, it's the originality of the movie. The director, Ali Samadi Amhadi, managed to find a way to communicate something that you cannot see, which is social media. He came up with the brilliant idea of using animation to show what the role was of social media in the, in, the, in, the, in the green wave and in the demonstrations. And this is so original that that's something that really pulls you into the movie. The other reason is that the people who are portrayed in the movie really talk to you. They talk to you and me. They talk to the audience. And they ask why we don't care more. And this way, this directness of the people that are interviewed pulls you into the movie and makes the viewer a part of the story. <coughs> And finally, it's very rare that a movie seems to become more relevant over time. We look at the movie today, we know there are elections going to come up next year in Iran, and we know what's going on in Syria. And this movie helps you to ask new questions about the situation in Iran, but also the situation in the countries after the Arab uprising and in Syria. And it helps you to ask questions about the roots, the causes, but most of all about the people who are affected. So in retrospect, this movie is nothing like Restrepo of last year, which some of you may have seen, and it's very much the same. Because what combines what you see in both movies is that they pull you in as a viewer. You become part of the story, and it makes you feel uncomfortable. And it makes that you don't forget the movie easily. Because these movies ask what you do with your responsibility and what you do to make this world a little bit better place. So I hope you really will be pulled into the issue tonight. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Damon Goris with his column written especially for you for tonight. Thank you. While the whole world is immensely concerned about the nuclear Iran, under Ayatollahs, we are together to hear the voice of the people of Iran and the recent blossom of their two centuries of struggle for freedom, the Green Movement. After three years, even the regime agrees that the Green Movement was a turning point for Iran. Even though they keep calling the movement a fitna, meaning evil, its momentum politically, its debt historically, and its latitude culturally concludes in only one desire, a peaceful political transformation to democracy. That is why Where Is My Vote, you will see in the movie later on, I think, became the slogan during the uprising of 2009. 
There are moments in history that seem perfectly ordinary to the world, yet those moments will shake you personally to the core. It stops, it stops being another item on the evening news. <coughs> it infiltrates the fiber of your being. The political becomes personal. Those of you who are Iranians can recall exactly this feeling remembering the 12th of June 2009, the presidential election day in Iran, three years ago. Elections in a country like in my native Iran were always a game. Government holding all the cards, making up numbers, to guarantee its legitimacy by holding elections. Of course, the ballot exists out of 500 versions of the same party, 500 shades of Islamic fundamentalists, fundamentalism. No one is actually campaigning with dreams, with dreams that matter. No candidate puts women's right issue on the ballot. No one is arguing the rule of Sharia law. A, a vicious cycle of choices between bad and worse continues the game, the game of election. What made the election of June 2009, though, unique was actually quite subtle, yet had huge impacts, impacts politically, culturally, and historically. A week before the elections, for the first time, historical state televised debates between candidates. It was very, it was very special. People who had been boycotting the government, like me, for many years, even friends, my closest friends in the Netherlands, for the first time in the years, talking about casting a vote, going to the embassy where they held, uh, they held demonstrations maybe a year ago for the opposition of Karubi or Musari, let's say, the Green candidates. This election became a game changer. The Iranian people realized that the right to vote, give to them in order to legitimize the rule of the Islamic Republic in Iran, was now their tool, was now their tool to limit the same government's power. The Iranian people called their bluff, and for the first time, instead of boycotting the elections, they actually participated in overwhelming numbers. Never before, never before was an Iranian presidential election so exciting as it was in 2009. Dictatorship <coughs> was forced to obey the power of votes. I personally couldn't sleep for 48 hours comparing polls, making screenshots of the Iranian state websites. Then the anti-climax of the stolen election, Ahmadinejad, by 63% of the votes within just six hours, it was not using computers, that, could, that couldn't be possible, that's impossible, I thought. Now remember it in flashes, a slideshow tights tits and bits of information, reports of election fraud, dis discrepancies, voting discrete accounting for up to 300% participation, that's, if not more, that's, that's huge. An entire nation in collective shock. People's outreach overflowing to the streets. Reports of violence against protesters by bare men, as we can see in Syria right now, in plain clauses. Then the images of young people on the street wearing green scarf and ribbons. What drove these people to the streets? They saw the simple answer to an infinitely simple question. Where is my vote? What could we do? What could we do? Halfway around the world, we organized support in Holland. The media sympathized, the government, they the same. The Dutch government made it possible to, to free the internet, to use the internet. The whole world, except the most important actor, Barack Obama. He wrote two letters to Khamenei to, to tell him, to ensure him, this cry of the people we do not hear. And it is not our business, so let's be friends. Khamenei refused afterwards. 
One thing was for sure, nothing was ever going to be the same again. Politic wasn't an affair of politicians, it had become even more personal than it was before that moment. It wasn't just people's mind that it had changed, people's heart had changed. And that was reflected in the works of artists, poets, politicians and movie makers. Never before we were witnessing such a grassroots movement. Average people in protest, the thought that we played your game, your rules and your candidates and still my voice was being muffled away in the static. Now, three years later, we don't hear a lot about green movement in Iran. You would say, and it's logic I think, what has happened with this movement? Is it dead? Is the green movement really dead? I don't think so. The green movement is not dead. It's hibernating, in my opinion. The most important virtue of the green movement is the institutionalizing of the civil power in the, historical, in the history of Iran. The votes and the willingness of the nation of Iran to accomplish changes by free elections. Different, as you can see, than the Arab revolutions at this stage. All the initiative of the stakeholders involved, EU, US, NGOs, like Human Rights Watch, of course, and activists, maybe among you, must encourage this promising discourse, the demand for free elections in Iran. That is the only way. Thank you. The situation in Iran hit home especially because uh, on June uh, 7, 2009, we had European elections here. On June 14, two days after the Iranian elections, I heard that I was elected to the European Parliament. And when I looked at someone like Neda, um, who voiced criticism against her government, I realized that I did the same. And I got elected and she got killed. And that is something very powerful to me that's you know, stuck with me, uh, and I think about it almost every day. Uh, and it was immediately that I became the spokesperson for Iran for my political group, uh, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. And um, there was a lot of hope uh, that, we, that we saw uh, from all these Iranian people that defied their fear uh, to, to go against this regime. And I think uh, the Iranian people have inspired a generation in the Middle East. Um, it's not always easy to know what we can do, but we're now focusing, and we have been focusing for the past three years, on keeping human rights in Iran on the agenda, despite a heavy emphasis on the nuclear issue. Uh, and currently, with all the uh, geopolitical tensions, with elections in the United States, uh, with uh, an unstable Syria, problems in Bahrain uh, and pretty much in the entire Middle East, uh, our main focus in Europe uh, is to come up with any solution but a military one, to really steer away from a, a military conflict. What's your view on that? What, what role will, will, will the past movement be playing in the future uh, political developments, specifically the elections next year? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's important to look at what happened in 2009. I think our guest uh, explained it well. I mean, prior to the 2009 presidential elections, there was a lot of voter apathy uh, in Iran. A lot of young people didn't vote. There was really no reason or hope in thinking that anything would change, either with presidential elections or parliamentary elections. And in 2009, uh, the, circumstance, uh, the circumstances were different. Um, it was mentioned before that they allowed presidential, um, you know, televised debates for the first time. Also, you know, Musavi was someone who had uh, steered Iran through the Iran-Iraq War during, uh, as prime minister. At that time, in the 1980s, Iran actually had a prime ministership. Um, it no longer has that. It only has a president. And, and, and then after that, he completely went away from politics. And he was in many ways an unknown. No one really quite knew what Musavi was about. Uh, Karubi, of course, had been in parliament. People knew him more. Um, and he was kind of seen in some circles, anyway, as a friend to human rights much more so than many of the other candidates in the elections. And so for the first time, you had two candidates who uh, eventually, uh, as it was shown, became, uh, somewhat unwillingly, I would say, um, the, the face of the, the Green Movement and the face of the opposition uh, in Iran. Um, this time around, uh, we will have presidential elections in June of 2013, June 14, uh, June 14 2013. <laughs> And, and I think the government will not be making the same mistakes uh, that it made uh, in 2009. 
So it's very possible that we will go back to uh, the years prior to 2009. Um, if, if the parliamentary elections this year, which happened uh, in March, are an indication, uh, we will have, uh, as it was mentioned before, a choice between uh, bad and worse. Uh, because as of now, none of the reformist candidates are allowed to participate, many of them are in prison. Uh, but a simple answer to your question is, uh, yes, the circumstances of 2009 perhaps will not be repeated. Um, but that desire for change is there, yeah. and every society has a melting point, and has a threshold. Um, and everyone for years said, Iranians don't care about elections. They just don't care. They will, no one will come into the streets. And in 2009, we saw that happen. Yeah. They said the same thing in Syria. We now see that that's different in Syria as well. So those circumstances can change. Civil society is vibrant and dynamic, even if the levers of control are pushing back on them as they have been since 2009 in Iraq. Okay. But it, 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 interesting what Farah says is that basically the regime seems to have learned from the happenings in 2009. What, what would the opposition and the international community what, what could they have learned from the situation that, that would, would enable them and empower them more in the future years? Um, well, I think what's really important now is to keep building an alternative to the, uh, to the regime or to those in power. Uh, because one day, and I believe it may be sooner uh, than, uh, than later, this regime will fall. Uh, and I think a lot of people within the regime and within the ranks of power are also beginning to wonder whether it's worth everything, whether the narrative still holds, whether the dogma still uh, sells. And this is also the result of sanctions, uh, unfortunately. Because I've long been very critical of the impact of sanctions on the Iranian population. I'm happy that the EU constantly, consistently chooses to uh, focus uh, very specifically on those in power and to uh, make sure that the population does not get hit. But in the last round of sanctions, uh, they were really intensified. The United States is also um, reaching uh, de facto into the EU with its secondary sanctions. Uh, I don't want to go into the technical details, but EU, EU uh, companies are impacted by US sanctions to a great extent. And so, sadly, the population suffers. And I think uh, the turning point that we've reached now is that where there was a fear that maybe sanctions would drive people into the hands of hardliners, we now see them turning their frustration against those in power. And even people in power sometimes don't get paid. Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult for the government to get uh, capital flows. The uh, currency is losing value. So there are real and very significant uh, changes taking place. And so the question is really when will the tipping point happen? And uh, of course, uh, we, we need to avoid any violence or uh, uh, well, any damage to people to the extent that we can. Uh, well, I, I would say, you know, I mean, uh, even to this day, even, even though after the 2009 presidential elections, uh, there really was a very harsh crackdown, not only on protesters, but on civil society in general, Iran still continues to have a vibrant civil society. Um, and, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of historical reasons for that. I mean, the literacy rate and, um, and, and th that definitely plays a part. Um, you know, university structure in Iran has always been very, very powerful and very strong. That plays a part. But I will generally say that um, what happened since 2009 is, is that the civil society is, has been hardest hit. And when Which I say civil society, you know, I mean, I mean rights activists, um, I mean lawyers, uh, I mean journalists. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch is going to put out a report uh, sometime in October, hopefully, um, which essentially highlights the struggles that civil society has had to go through um, post-2009 presidential elections in Iran. And it's a report that gathers the testimonies of most of these civil society activists, mostly I'm speaking again about journalists, rights activists, and lawyers, um, who were forced to leave the country. Um, and the numbers are not huge. We're not talking about a mass exodus or a mass brain drain. We're not talking about that. But we are talking about some very high profile figures who, um, after 2009, saw that there really was no future, at least for them and their families, and that they couldn't continue being civil society activists in Iran, and were, f were forced to make the extremely difficult decision to cross the border into Turkey or to cross the border into Iraqi Kurdistan and, and seek resettlement. And it's, a, it's an extremely difficult decision because these are individuals, these are prominent lawyers in Iran 
Once you cross that border, you are no one. You are a number, that you have a UNHCR refugee number, you have to wait like everybody else does for several months, maybe sometimes several years, to be resettled. And once you're resettled, you know, the, the value that you have to Iranian society in some ways diminishes, at least in the eyes of Iranian yeah, soldiers. Sure, sure. So that's, that, I would say, is one of the tragedies of what happened post-2009.